I'm Joe Bianca. I'm John Green. And we are here live from the OBS sales grounds. They say the harder the work, the greater the reward. This is our life's work. Good morning. It is 944, Wednesday, April 21st. This is the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the associate editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. And I've been here at the sale for a couple days, and if I've learned one thing, it's don't accidentally raise your hand or scratch your head. Or I came home with a horse I didn't mean to yesterday. <laughs> Jonathan Green, general manager of DJ Stable. And for this week only, I am taking Bill Finley's title. Which is no title. Which is no title. title. Okay, yeah, just, for, just to be clear now, that's going to be blank at the bottom. Um, so yeah, if you, if you haven't noticed, here we are at the OVS Sales Grounds. This is our first live show. We're super, super excited. we got a bunch of great interviews. Our amazing crew has come down here to help us out. Um, so we're, we're, we're excited to bring this to you. It might be a little bit of a test run for some future live shows. Don't want to spoil anything, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. So welcome to the first live on, on scene TDN Writers Room. The TDN Riders Room is presented by Keeneland. Designed with flexibility in mind, the Keeneland April Horses of Racing Age sale is back during the excitement of Kentucky Derby Week. The sale features a new integrated format featuring an enhanced all digital catalog available to view now. Buyers can participate on site or anywhere in the world. The sale begins at 1 p.m. on Monday, April 26th. Learn more and view the catalog at keeneland.com sales. All right, so we didn't have a huge racing weekend last week, but we had one marquee race that we talked about a whole bunch. Um, it was the Apple Blossom. It was the, billed as the big showdown between Monomoy Girl and Swiss Skydiver. Monomoy Girl, Swiss Skydiver 2, Electric Boogaloo. But again, it didn't happen. The last time in the Breeders' Cup, it didn't happen. We never got that, that set up. Um, Swiss Skydiver wasn't off that well, and, and you know, then, then we never got that matchup. This time we also didn't get it because Swiss Skydiver didn't show up for whatever reason. And that's a big part of the story. But the biggest part of the story was the battle between Monomoy Girl and Latruska. Now, if you had given me 50 to 1 on Latruska at the 16th pole, I wouldn't have taken it. You know, no, right, when Monomoy right. Girl, who's a wind machine, for whatever else you want to say about her, she passes horses and she puts them away. This time she could not, for whatever reason, and Latruska you know, unexpectedly and really improbably battled back to win that race. So this is, I'm going to let you talk eventually. But the, the point I wanted to make about this race, it really struck me how these horses are competitive. They have competitive spirits. And we talk a lot on this show about horses who are being forced to run, who, and there are, are great many horses who in this country and around the world who are being forced to run. But most horses, I think, have that competitive spirit and enjoy running. And I think that was laid bare in this race specifically because Latruska had no reason to come back and win that race other than competitive spirit. And it's a, it's a remarkable phenomenon. It's like I can't think of anything else like that in the animal kingdom that you have that kind of competitive spirit with, 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 with an animal. And I think that was the kind of race that should really be appreciated and to show people that, you know, these horses really do have a purpose. They do have co competition inside them when they run. And, you know, hats off to Latruska and the connections. Fausto Gutierrez is a really good trainer. I think he's going to get some better horses over time, but he's done an incredible job with her. He's turned her from kind of a runaway speed, one-way speed horse to a horse you can rate a little bit. It was a great ride by Irad. And that's just, it's, it's a remarkable thing to watch a horse come back after being beaten, seeming beaten like that. Well, and, and Joe, you bring up an excellent point as far as a, horse, a horse's desire and want to. And, you know, we hear it at the April sale and we've watched, you know, a thousand, literally a thousand horses breeze on the under tax show. And most of them are within two fifths of a second, plus or minus, either way. So what's the difference? Maybe it's their breeding, genetics, confirmation, but it's that heart that they can't measure yet. You just can't measure a horse's desire to want to run. And Latruska showed that. I mean, not only did she want to win, she did win. And she beat a very good group of, of, of older mares. Um, you talk about how many grade one winners and grade two winners were actually in the field albeit a small field, it was one of the few legitimate grade one races uh, that we've seen so far this year. And, and we didn't see the, the big gangbuster, um, you know, duke out between the top two fillies. Instead, we were all surprised at just how well Latruska ran. And I echo everything that you said. I think that um, it showed a lot for the industry. It was great for the business. You know, we can go into um, the, the mathematics of, well, Monomoy Girl was carrying extra weight. And, you know, did she run a little bit further than Latruska? And that's, it doesn't matter. Latruska, yeah. you know, beat them off their feet 
ran them down, you know, ran them, uh, you know, from gate to wire the entire way, and then had the want to at the end to beat a world champion Hall of Fame Philly. It really is a remarkable thing to watch. And, and you know, Vic Stoffer, some people give him some crap for his, for his calls, but I thought he had a great call on that race. I thought he really, he captured the moment. Um, and it's, I, I hope that, you know, Latruska can, can stick around and battle with Modern White Girl and, and Swiss Skydiver because I feel like that's been the one knock on Modern White Girl so far is that she does win a lot. She's very consistent. She's admirable. She came back from injury. But who is she actually beating? Like, what top class fillies and mares have you seen her go to toe to toe with and, and, and beat? I mean, Midnight Bisu is the only one I can yeah. think of. You know, since then, it's been, it's, it's, been a lot of you know subpar mediocre fillies and mares no disrespect to any horse in particular but you know if we get swiss skydiver to bounce back from that race maybe third time's the charm when they meet up and then for latruska to stick around i think maybe she's she's planted that seed of doubt in my yeah. girl's yeah. mind that you know this is a horse that i i usually put away and she comes back and, and beats me. So, you know, maybe we can get some of those matchups the rest of the year in the Philly and Mayor division. We have, you know, we got the personal ends in, we've got the, uh, the Ogden Phipps, we've got, we've got, we've got a bunch of good, good races coming up. We've got the La Troyenne. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll see them clash a couple more times. Uh, before we moved on, move on from this past weekend's action, I wanted to mention one other horse who is Cezanne, who was a, a $3.65 million purchase, I believe last year at, at one of the two-year-old sales for Bob Baffert showed a lot of promise as a, as a three-year-old, but just couldn't stay on the racetrack. And, you know, he wasn't able to factor in the, even in the delayed triple crown. He came back on Sunday and ran the Kona Gold Stakes, which is a grade three at Santa Anita, and won by nine and three-quarter lengths and got a 106 buyer. He's, we, we talked about the, the sprint division and whether or not, you know, there was anybody to, to challenge mischievous Alex or maybe Charlatan if he, if he turns back. That's a horse, if he can stick around, might be that dynamite sprinter, you know, to fill the shoes of Matoli from two right, years Mattoli, ago. Because yeah. since then, we haven't really had that, that blowout sprinter, I don't think. Yeah, and, and you know, you look at the, the, the Breeders' Cup sprint from last year, and there's a couple holdovers that, that have come back. Um, but for the most part, we're looking at some new shooters at this, at this stage. You mentioned Charlton, which I think leads us into another bit of news. Yeah, so yesterday, uh, this came out in the TDN and, and, and throughout the industry. It's the... Uh, hopefully the end of the long saga of the Arkansas Derby. Uh, if you remember, Charlatan won the Arkansas Derby by about six lengths last year. It came out later on that he had a lidocaine positive. He was disqualified from, from that purse. Um, and Baffert and his, Bob Baffert and his attorneys have been pressing the issue and challenging it in the courts. Yesterday, they got a victory. Uh, Arkansas, was it the race? It was the racing board. The racing board overturned the DQ and put Charlatan back up first in that race. So I don't know how they're, they're going to get the 60 grand back from the trainer or the 600 grand back from the owner who was put up in that race. So like, you're going to have to see me in court for that money. But I don't want to throw any, anybody under the bus here. But it just it looks a little silly when the horse is DQ'd and then a year later they put the horse back up. And that happened with Justify, too, when he had the scopolamine positive. You know, it was, it was this long saga for like two years before eventually Baffert was exonerated. And we have to, we have to mention that part. But it's just, it, it's one of those things where it kind of looks a little Mickey Mouse where the, the sport can't really get it together and even figure out who the winner of our race is until a year after the fact. So, right. I mean, what do you think? It's not even a little Mickey Mouse. And I know we're saying that because they're just outside of Orlando. Big old but Mickey big, Mouse. It's a big old Mickey Mouse because, yeah. you know, the, the, the board decided that, that not only were they going to uphold the original decision, but they were just going to modify the penalties. So basically what they're saying is, yes, the horse tested positive, or horses tested positive, um, but we're going to ignore that and we're just going to reduce the penalties which doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So, you know, it, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, disparage Bob Baffert or anything. He was exonerated. And, you know, from now on, hopefully, Charlatan will be the winner of the Arkansas Derby. Hopefully we don't want to have an, another DQ. Um, and, and maybe this, this takes a little bit of the dark cloud on Gamine off for some people at least, you know, because, I, well, she, she also had another positive as well. So maybe, maybe half the dark cloud. It's still listen, a little, listen, don't, don't, don't uh, mess with Kameen. You know how I feel about Kameen and how I've always said that she's the best sprinter 
you know, male or female, best sprinter in the <laughs> when country. When you were trying to make her a champion male sprinter, I remember that. I was trying I was to make like, her dual that champion. Was, that's fine. That was that's a little fine. confusing. Well, listen, if they're bending the rules on, on, on this situation saying they're guilty, but we're going to, you know, uh, reduce the, uh, the the penalty, then why can't my horse, Gamine, be, uh, you know, be dual champion? All right. Well, we'll look into that, John. Um, yeah. But so this was, this took a little bit too long and, and it, it's not a great look for racing that this isn't, you know, this isn't unheard of for no. things like this no. to go back and forth through the courts forever. So. Um, I don't know if this is the kind of thing that would be fixed from USADA coming in, but I, I, it's got to help to have like yeah. a uniform standard to where these things, you know, it, there's not so much murkiness between, you know, between this overage and that overage in this state and that state, you know, I, it, it's got to help to have a little bit more clarity, don't you think? You have, you have to have consistency. You yeah. have to have consistency in the rules and in the fines and the penalties um, if for no other reason to protect the trainers because, you know, these poor trainers are running horses in you know, multi-states. I mean, you look at any any horse and, and they're going from racetrack to racetrack or state to state. And it's near impossible for most of these trainers to remember, okay, well, this has a 14-day window, but, you know, I can't give this medication 14 days in New Jersey, but I can give it to them, you know, 48 hours in advance in New York or, or, or vice versa. And, and it's got to be difficult. So just for the ease of racing overall and for these trainers to have to focus just on training as opposed to worrying about medication rules yeah. um, from state to state, it, it, it would make it, you know, uniform make it better for everybody and I think would be an overall better product and I think you would alleviate a lot of these kind of false positives or questionable positives if there was one set of rules right like I said it's too much murkiness you know I, I think the the alib and I'm not saying this is the case with Baffert but I think it leaves a lot of room for people to have alibis when they have these drug positives and, and to say well it was environmental contamination even if it really wasn't and I'm not saying that this was the case but you know, I, I, I think the, the ambiguity of the rules and the way they vary leads to this kind of confusion and this, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's hard to figure out what justice is in these scenarios, you know, and that's, that's I think, something that can only be helped from having uniform policy. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. They say the harder the work, the greater the reward. And this is hard work. It's the hours put in before dawn and after dark. It's the sacrifice, the sweat, the failure, and the faith. This is our industry. This is our life's work. Owning a multiple graded stakes winning racehorse like Decorated Invader is attainable with a racing partnership like West Point Thoroughbreds. Partnerships enable you to spread your ownership across several horses for less than it costs to own one horse alone. This increases your racetrack action and chances for a big horse. Learn more about why West Point Thoroughbreds is the gold standard in racing partnerships at westpointtb.com. All right, so we had a little bit of whip news this week. You know, my favorite topic, Bill's favorite topic too. It's a shame that Bill can't be here to argue with me about the whip for the hundredth time. Um, but so th this was, uh, the, New Jersey inst instated, tried to instate new rules for the whip, new restrictive rules, kind of like the typical thing that they're trying to do, which is you can only use the whip in, you know, in, 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 for safety if the horse is out of control. I feel like that's, again, like a little bit of a murky, you know, self-interpretation thing. But regardless, they tried to do that uh, last year. The Jockeys, the Jockeys Guild challenged it. And then yesterday, the Racing Commission upheld their original rules. Uh, the Jockeys Guild is obviously very unhappy about this. You know my feelings on it. I'm not, like, I'm not a, I'm not, I'm not a guy that likes whipping horses, but I do think it's it's necessary in some cases because they, you know, there's there are motivational factors to it. Like we can't lie about that. You know, even when we were talking before about Latruska coming back and winning that race, you got to think the whip had a little bit to do with it. So. I think as long as it's not cruel, as long as we're not you know, really hurting the animals, I think it's just, it's just a popping sound. Like, that's my feeling. Regardless, we've already been all through all that. Uh, I think one of the issues, and, and you can talk more about this, is, is the lack of input. Well, right? that's, yeah. And, and that really is the issue in, in my mind, Joe. You're exactly right. Um, if you're going to implement some of these rules, you have to involve the people that are going to be the end users. Um, so same thing with the medication rules. You have to have, you know, trainers come in and veterinarians come in and say, you know, their piece, um, albeit even if, if it's contradictory of each other, at least you have to have input from them so you have an understanding of what's going on. You know, I've never been on a horse, even though we've owned horses for 40 years, and I can't tell you you know, if it's, what is excessive? Is it 
five times, you know, getting hit? Is it six times? Is it the seventh time? Is it when horses are tiring? But I think at the end of the day, you need to have the end users, the decision makers, which are the jockeys, involved in this process. They have to be accountable for, for the rules, so why wouldn't you want to have them be involved in the rule making? And if you feel like, well, it, there's going to be too many voices, and that's fine. Take represent, representatives. Um, Joe Bravo, who is actually the, the president of the New Jersey Jockeys Guild, actually was quoted in the article saying that all we ask is just that we're involved in the process. And you know what? He's 100% right, because they're the ones that are putting their, life, their lives in their hands every time they get on a horse's back. Um, so if they feel like that they need to have the, the crop for safety purposes, then that's the way it should be. If they feel like, hey, this gives a horse a little bit additional incentivization, whether it's because of the sound or because of the feeling, it almost doesn't matter. But um, you know, then, then they need to have um, a certain limited number of times they can strike a horse and the way that they can strike the horse. And I think other race uh, venues have done a good job of recognizing that. Um, and they've made it safer for the horse and they've made it a better overall product. I don't think you can necessarily take it away 100% without any input whatsoever by the jockeys. Agreed. And, you know, I think whips are partially needed because the horse doesn't know where the wire is. You know, even the horses like to run and they're competitive, they need to be signaled in some way when to turn it on and off. And I think that that's one of the key things that, that the whip does. And like I said, uh, I've said this before, I'm all for making them as humane as possible, but I don't think that you can get rid of them entirely. And this, you know, Bill likes to talk about the, uh, the woodbine experiment and like, how, you know, how that didn't, didn't affect handle. I don't know, I think this is, is gonna be the big experiment. And I know you're, you're not running this, this year at Monmouth, but it's gonna be interesting to see, because I know there are gonna be some big trainers and big barns well, that are coming, so. And big jockeys that are, that aren't, that are saying they're not coming to New yeah. Jersey now because of the, their safety issues. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's going to be the interesting experiment because I feel like this is the most restrictive whip policy that, that, that is being put in place. And I think you're 100% right that, you know, regardless of where you fall on this issue, I think we can all agree that it's a problem that the people on the backs of the horses themselves are not being included in this discussion. I think that that is kind of unacceptable. And, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, Maybe some people think jockeys are a little biased themselves, that this is the way they've always done it, so they're, you know, they're not going to be receptive to any, any kind of reforms. But at the same time, you have to have them in the conversation, for transparency's sake right. at least, yep. to, 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 have, to hear everybody out and let everybody know, including the people who are going to be most affected by it, what the standard is right. going to be going forward. And Joe, I can, I can remember just in, in talking about it with you right now, I remember when they implemented helmet rules and they implemented the, the flat jacket rule and jockeys were involved in those decisions um, because they were the end users. They were the ones that were going to be wearing this equipment and, and it was for their benefit. Um, and they, I think they, you know, there were a couple of them that grumbled about it and eventually, um, you know, they, they ended up putting it on and it was for everyone's safety. It's no different than a seatbelt. Um, and again, in this case, if they're going to be the ones holding the equipment, they should be the ones involved in it, at least adding a voice to making a decision. Agreed, and I'm just so happy that Bill's not here to push back <laughs> and say, you don't need to whip a horse. Like, oh, sorry, we miss you, Bill, I'm just kidding. That was a good um, impression of him. I thought he was sitting right next to me, actually. Hold on, let me do my Bill impression. <laughs> Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. Learn more at westpointtb.com. We'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds. All the thrills. Fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. The Green Group Guests of the Week are sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. So our first Green Group Guest of the Week this week is consigner Randy Miles. <laughs> how are you guys? Randy, good to see you. John, how are you? Good, All right. great. Okay, so we're going to ask a little bit about the consignment. We're going to ask some broader questions. The first thing I wanted to ask is, the difference between last year and this year, obviously there was a huge, oh gosh. huge crisis going on around the sales, and not just around the sales industry, but in your corner of the world. How oh. does it feel to be back here and things are slightly more normal? Oh, the, it, the weight is just lifted off our back. We were, 
we had no idea what was going to happen last year. We, um, we actually were maybe trying to sell some horses privately because we didn't know what the market was going to be like. And we all know that it, we survived it. We actually did pretty well. And uh, we still went into this year a little apprehensive as far as the money we were investing back. Um, but gosh, it's, I can't tell you, you know, and, and part of this business is not about the money. It's about all of our friends. And it's just so nice to be out here for this two week period. And all of our friends are here. It's like a big party. Everybody seems like they're in a good Everybody, mood. Everybody's in a great mood and it's just refreshing. And if we can get the racetracks back to this, it'll be so much fun. No, the, the, the financial always takes care of itself. But, but the people is what makes it fun. Yeah, and, and Randy, yeah. you guys consistently have sold great athletes, great racehorses, but I know there's a ton of work that goes into it oh, when oh, you're oh. at the yearling sales. Give our audience an idea of when you go to the Keeneland September sale or you go to the Phasic July sale, what amount of time and effort you put oh, into finding these ha well, athletes? Well, we have a, a great small team. It's, it's myself, Bo Hunt, who is the mastermind of this whole thing, and my wife, who is the veterinarian. And, and that's all Bo will allow us to have. It's just the three of us. So it's a lot of work. Uh, we don't want to waste any time. Um, so it's Bo and I looking at the horses and Lisa's in the background reviewing the x-rays and making sure these are horses that we want to present next year. And it, it's, it, Bo wears me out. <laughs> <laughs> but Bo is, I, I got to give him all the credit. He, you know, in, in, our, in our part of the industry, he is one of the best, and he's very strict on what he wants to buy, what he wants to pay for these horses, so that we, when we present them back, everybody has a chance to buy them. We're trying to buy the best individual we can for the least amount, so that the buyers get the benefit. They don't have to pay the exorbitant amount of money for good racehorses. And so we have that little bit of niche and it's been successful for us for a long time, but it's a lot of leg work, a lot of leg work. And uh, we'll miss some horses just because we're trying to take it easy on my wife. And we had a case, in fact, last year that we that happened to us and we'll never do that again. That's we just right. got to keep working hard. All right. <laughs> um, so you said you have, you have a smaller operation. There's definitely a variance of size in terms of the consignors mm -hmm. over here on the backstretch. Do you think that that gives you any kind of advantages? You can be more hands on? Um, yes and no. Uh, you know, in the racing game and even in the selling game, numbers win. And so it's, it's great that some of the larger consigners are always going to get some of the top horses coming out of their barns. That, that's, that's just the numbers game of racing. Um, yes, we get to do a little bit more individual work where we can maybe help that average horse become better. Um, super horses are just super horses. They, they, you could lock them in a chicken coop and they're going to be a good horse. So. We just try to take that average horse and try to give him the special attention and make him a little bit better. Right, yeah. right. And you mentioned, you know, the, the fact that you guys are a boutique consignment compared to a lot of the other consignments, yet you've had some recent success um, with yeah. some great horses. Yeah. Even last year, you know, Miss Brazil, who mm -hmm. is a multiple stake winner, yeah. obviously Helium, yes. um, who's a great two winner. Yes. Uh, I heard like, that horse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We haven't talked about him very much on this yeah. show. No, um, we, had, we, we graduated from you guys. Yes, and we had Steven last year who won, a, he was a stakes right. winner in Canada. And we just, and we won, we, I don't want to tout my horn, but we had 14 winners at Oaklawn this year. Wow. I think just from out of our barn. That's with our small numbers, that's a big, that's, that, that's, a, that's big numbers. So sure. yes, and, and I can't take credit for that. That is my partner, Bo Hunt. He is one hell of a horse buyer. All right, so let's pivot towards the future. You got yeah. some nice horses coming up in the next couple of days. I heard there's an Intimister filly that is going to sell particularly well. Can you talk about her and yeah. the rest of the consignment? Yeah, no, we're very fortunate to have the Intimister filly. That's uh, a longtime client. Uh, Mr. Bloom owns that horse and he bred her, which is nice. And he just asked us to sell her. And it's just so nice to have, we, we can't go out and buy those horses. Those right. are horses we don't normally get our hands on. And, you know, she's, she's the top, she's, she's the queen. You know, she came out and showed her stuff on the track and she's got her x-rays done and they're all clean and good to go. And, and uh, she's showing well and hopefully 
you know, she's going to be at the end of the sale. So it's what we always call the last good horse in the sale. Yeah. So, you know, hopefully she will, you know, be well received. I was going to ask you to put a number is. on it, but I know no you guys way. are superstitious. <laughs> no, so. way. Yeah. no way. Yeah. No way. And, no, and to be honest, you know, and, and Jeff is the same way. Jeff Bloom, he's the same way. He's just, he's one of those guys that just is happy that everything worked out because it's just such a risky side of the right. business and it's all timing and everything has worked out. So he's just gratified that we're, we're to this point yeah. and we have two days to go and you know, we're just gonna sit back and enjoy it. She's up there do now just doing all the work. We're yeah. sitting there just, in, we're keeping her out of trouble. That's right. what we exactly. do. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And Randy, one more question for you. So for those, for our audience at home, are you more nervous when you buy the horse, when the horse is breezing, or when, you're, when the horse is in the oh, ring and you're selling them? That's a great question because I love to buy. I'm, 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 I'm an addict when it comes to buying. I'll buy every horse, and thank God to Bo because he's, he keeps me uh, in, in reality. He's like, we can't do that. I love to buy, so that's the easy part. And the selling part just comes natural to me, so I love that part too. The most nervous to me is the breezing, and not actually on breeze day. It's the prep breeze that scares me more than anything because you have to do enough to teach the horse what to do, but you have to do less to hold some in the tank. And that is the most nervous part to me. I'm watching to see what's the rider asking the horse to do, um, let, it, let it do enough so it learns, and, and, and it, it's gotta come back good because we ha at the end of the day, we have to have a horse to sell. So that day, the prep breeze, the week before the breeze show is right. the ner most ner more nerve wracking time to me. Yeah. Well, well Randy, thank you so much You're for stopping well. by thanks and for thanks for the time. This yep. has been yeah. great. And good luck yeah. on, uh, on the last day of the sale at the end of Thank you very so much. Exciting. He's got a funny joke. No, no, no. I was going to say, <laughs> go John with him. <laughs> 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 right. Thank you guys. Thanks so much, Randy. I really appreciate, going appreciate it. Good luck, John. See you. Thank you. Talk to you later. Thanks, guys. This week's TDN Story of the Week is brought to you by the Minnesota Racehorse Engagement Project. Find out how you can get involved in racehorse ownership at Canterbury Park this summer with several options and investments ranging from $250 to $10,000. Visit racehorseminnesota.com to learn more. So our Story of the Week so far this week in Ocala is Doc Eisenman, who sold the topper yesterday for $850,000. We're gonna talk to him about that, that horse and more. So at this time, we'd like to bring in the man of the hour, from yesterday at least. Doc Eisenman of Eisenman Equine. Hey, Thanks thank so much you. for coming on, You're Doc. welcome. Thank you. Good to see Good you. Good to see you, Doc. Thanks Good for coming. You. You're welcome. All right, so you are the story of the day. I am. Uh, sold an $850,000 session topper yesterday, Colt by Gunrunner, homebred too. So can you just talk about how much that meant to you, not just to have the session topper by a good margin, but also for it to be homebred? Well, you know, my wife, is the brains behind the management of our mayors and mayor and it was extremely rewarding for her she picked gunrunner she helped select that mayor uh, you know to have one that we raised right from a little puppy to yesterday was was very good and doc coming into the sale you know we all want to have sales toppers but what were your expectations for this cult i think every year when we leave the farm and head into the sale there's young horses that are doing everything quite well he was one of them but you never really, at that point, recognize that he's gonna catch on with the right buyers and be that successful. After he got here and trained here, and his breeze show happened, and he galloped out so well, and he showed so much and with such poise, you begin to evolve into understanding this, this is a pretty nice horse. Uh, our expectations were never in the range that he brought yesterday. We knew he would sell well, but you never really reach for that number, you know, so it was a good day for, for us and our family, my wife, our brood mares. I noticed that there were 12 different consigners and 12 different buyers for the top 12 horses yesterday. Can you talk about how competitive it is out here in the back, on the well, barns? Well, this sale, the April sale, is a, a great sale for buyers to come to because there's all quality horses from, if you race, uh, at Prairie Meadows or in, in anywhere versus Saratoga, you can find the horse for your needs. So the fact that yesterday you had 12, the 12 highest priced horses going to 12 different people, uh, you know, it illustrates the competitiveness to get to those top horses. It's not like somebody came in here and bought half of those. Uh, so 12 different people, it's really huge. And Doc, you've obviously been doing this for 
you know. Don't say that. <laughs> We've known you for 30 years, how about that, <laughs> since you were in junior high. Yeah. Um, and obviously the business has evolved and, and your consignment has evolved, evolved over the years. Give us a little micro and macro analysis of how you know, um, Isom and Equine has evolved and also how the business has changed. Well, historically, uh, we were one of the first consigners to start to stop taking our best horses out of town. You know, so we stopped going to Miami and to California and just brought our best horses to OBS March. And it rewarded us very well over the years. We were a leading consigner in the March sale, I don't know, 10 out of 12 years or something. And then as time went on, more and more really top quality horses came to March and it started to dilute uh, our horses because they, then they were compared to lots of other really good horses. And so more recently, we've switched to concentrating on this April sale where we have a, you know, the April sale now is the Keelan September of the two-year-old market. And this will be the second year we brought everything that we have to April and it's rewarded us very well. In April, you can sell an $850,000 horse and you can sell a $20,000 horse and everything in between. I wanted to ask about this because we're kind of a big picture show and I think one of the trends that we've seen in the last year or two is racing trying to get safer, whether it's making racetracks safer, whether it's cracking down on drugs. What do you think is something that the two-year-old sales sector can do better or is doing better to improve safety for the horses? I think there's a lot more done in the two-year-old sales scene than maybe is recognized by the general public. Um, you know, here at OBS, uh, where we sell most, and uh, where I'm, I've been on the board for many years, you know, the, the, the installation of the synthetic surface was done mainly for safety. And prior to the synthetic surface, this past week's breeze show would have been treacherous because the last day we had horrible rains, and in the olden times, with a conventional surface, that would have been a sea of soup trying to breeze horses in. And so sometimes there's a concern that um, you can't separate the horses as well on a conventional surface. And if you re rely on the mathematics to do that for you, true. You know, there's a lot of, they bunch around some of the faster times. But it, on this surface, all 10 flats are not created equal. You know, if you study them and watch them, there's good movers, there's poor movers, there's horses being really showing that that's, I mean, they're in distress to even go that fast. So you can separate the horses. And at the end of the day, the numbers of uh, serious injuries have decreased immensely. Uh, the numbers of horses that go on to their destination end up being a sounder horse because of it. And you don't have to buy a two-year-old and send them to a mash unit for three months to get over the sale. So it's helped a lot that way. Um, medication. Things are controlled pretty tightly in the two-year-old sales world. Um, you know, so and this, the use of the stick before the uh, during the brie show has been curtailed a bunch. Where it used to be, sometimes on the offensive side with riders that come maybe to the April sale and it's their Kentucky Derby of their year, and they get carried away, and all all that's been curtailed. So um, I think beyond anything, this sales company and the two-year-old consigners that really are in this for the long haul are concerned about the safety of the horses, about them getting to their destination in one piece, and about the buyer of those horses being pleased and coming back to buy more. Right, and, and that's a great point, Doc, because I think as an industry, we're all trying to strive to make things safer for the athlete, um, and, and we all appreciate that. And one of the other things, aside from two-year-olds that you manage, are also some older horses. And Chuck Zachney from Cassius King uh, was standing in the winner's circle when mischievous Alex just won a grade one, Correct. and the very first person he thanked was you. Tell us a little bit now, about- Did you get that on tape, or is that that's just <laughs> Can we roll that in? <laughs> Make sure that yeah, well, but, but when you have a horse like that that's under your care and then he blossoms to the next level and wins a grade one, it, what does that do for you as an individual? I mean, it, it builds our portfolio as being suppliers and you know caregivers to really, really good horses. And that is a very rewarding thing. You know, we have never raced. We, we decided decades ago that we were going to provide services for rehabilitation and for selling horses. Some systems that do race 
are recognized by the buying public as, oh, well, you picked out the six you like best and you set them over on this pile and here's what we have left over. Enjoy yourself buying these horses. You know, so we wanted to bring everything that we have offered for sale. Um, and when we sell a horse like Mischievous Alex, of course, we did sell him. We had him as a yearling. We sold him. He came back for some rest and rehabbed. But it's rewarding to sell a horse like that. And we're very, very happy for Chuck and people that buy horses like that from us. Sometimes you get owners that want to sell on the two-year-old sales, but they really they really don't want to sell a good horse. They want to sell a horse to make some money, but if they're really good, they have seller's remorse. We are delighted when the horses we sell go on to, you know, accolades. And, and one of the things, just one second, you're selling Alex's half sibling, right, at the sale? Yes, he's in this sale. He's by Outwork, and uh, he sells today, actually. Fantastic. All right, I got one more question. You told us a story yesterday about how things could potentially <laughs> go wrong at the sales as well as go right. Can you uh, relate nothing, that? Nothing ever goes wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but almost, but almost. Well, the story uh, he's referring to is uh, our daughter, Chris, is uh, just getting ready. She got accepted this week to veterinary school at the University of Florida. That's great, congratulations. And she and my wife, Sherry, picked out a yearling in September for Chris to sell under her own banner. Uh, so she got to help buy, watch it develop, and it turns out to be a really nice horse, and he trains well. If I put him on our racetrack with 10 half-million-dollar horses, you can't separate him from the rest of them. He's very nice. He, he worked well here. He galloped out well here. He vets well. He's hip 902. He's a Klimt colt. And everything's sailing along like Chris may get into vet school and then help to pay for it all in one week. Uh, so he was showing a couple of mornings ago and doing well and all of a sudden a squirrel attacked some guy standing not far from him, <laughs> ran up the guy's pant leg and then understandably this guy is freaking out and he's swatting the squirrel with his hat and yelling and it really upset this colt and he almost got loose from his handler. Had he gotten loose as hyped on adrenaline as he was at the moment, it wouldn't have been a pretty story because he'd have been with the shank going, next thing would have been a fence or who knows what. But that's a new way for things to go wrong when you're on the cusp of selling a horse. Well, yeah. now you know how they came up with the term squirrely. Right? It's not exactly that. Yeah. yeah, you've heard a lot of horror stories about Florida, but I've never heard of killer squirrels, so that's a new one. Well, make sure you wear your jeans. The shorts are a bad, bad idea. <laughs> yeah, I'm faster than Joe, so it's okay. I yeah. You can tell running the squirrels by looking but, at them. But exactly. if they went up those shorts, you wouldn't be too fast. It might be the most active. Anyway, okay. Well. All right, but Doc, thanks so much for coming on. We welcome. appreciate the time and congratulations Thank on you. yesterday's success. Good luck the rest of the sale. Thank you very much. Guys. Right, thanks, Doc. Thanks, Doc. We'll be right back after this message from the Minnesota Racehorse Engagement Project. Next up in the hot seat is Nick Demerick of Demerick Sales. Come on down, Nick. Thanks for, thanks for coming by. Appreciate it. Nice to Good see you. Good seeing you, you guys. Yeah. Batter up. Good um, to see you too. All right, so I wanted to ask a general question about the feeling on the sales grounds, because I remember doing a story last year. I spoke to you about it, about what consigners were doing during the two year old sale pause because of the pandemic. And I was, we were just talking to Randy Miles about how everyone just seems like they're in a good mood now. Can you talk about the difference between this year and last year? Yeah, I, I think the atmosphere is uh, diametrically opposed to the, the atmosphere at a corresponding time last year. I think that, uh, I, in fact, I was quoted as saying uh, uh, in the last sale that I think people have been on lockdown so long and had restricted travel for so long, they're just ready to come out and play, you know? Yeah. And uh, what better place to play than at a two-year-old sale? Yeah. So I think, and you know, it's the beginning of a year. There is a, definitely a feeling of optimism in the air. And um, hopefully that'll be reflected in the overall results at the end of, end of this sale. For sure. Yeah, and Nick, you have a, a couple of superstars hopefully coming up in the next couple of days. Um, do we want to go over yeah. a, a, a couple of those? I know you have a, a Quality Road and Into Mischief, a couple of Curlins. We, we have some potential 
potential stars. I mean, we, as we all know, if this business teaches you nothing else, it teaches you to stay humble. But um, we do have a couple of potential stars. We have a, a, a fabulous uh, quality road colt that sells a little later today. We have a couple of intermischiefs that we think a, an awful lot of, a Curlin, uh, uh, candy ride. Uh, we, we've got some name sires re represented in the consignment, and uh, the horses have performed well, and they've they vetted well after their performance. And um, you know, uh, people seem to be lining up in a few spots. So right. fingers crossed. And, and Nick, because of the the, the depth of your talent base mm. in in the horses, um, you sell at multiple different venues. Tell the audience a little bit about how you decide which horses are going to go to which sale. Well. Uh, what we try to do is uh, fit the horse to the venue as best we can. We, we love this sale in particular because I, I think there is no question that OBS April gets your horse in front of more people than it will get you in front of at any other sale in the country. Uh, Timonium has been a very good sale for us too over the years. Uh, South Florida is kind of a boutique sale. It, it's, a, it's a wonderful sale when everything lines up. And um, the March sale was very good this year too. So um, I think that uh, in, in terms of when we're deciding, uh, maturity comes into it, pedigree comes into it, confirmation and physical development come into it, and when, how far along the horse is and his training also comes into it. But we're very fond of this sale, it's been very good to us over the years and hopefully will continue to be. I wanted to ask that I, I feel like you guys have built a winning culture. I would mm. I would liken it to maybe the Los Angeles Lakers and the, <laughs> the Pittsburgh Steelers or what yeah. have you. Um, do you think that that helps at all? Kind of having that long-standing credibility in the industry, where if someone's 50-50 on a horse, but they see it's demeric, it helps. Well, you're very kind to say that. Uh, um, you'd like to think that that does have some bearing on, on, on people's confidence level when they're bidding. We we've, we've always tried to treat people fairly and honestly. Um, and uh, I think people know that. I think another factor is that people know they can buy from us. Uh, we sell horses. And when we, w for us, a successful sale is when we don't buy any back or we buy a very small number back. Uh, we, we like people to know that our horses are accessible. Sometimes, um, not always at the price we hoped. Uh, and. Um, that's okay too uh, and if people are successful with purchases from us and they bought horses that we felt were slightly undervalued we're fine with that um, because those people will become repeat customers and um, but i think you know uh, one's name and one's reputation are important in this business and um, you know there are plenty of people around here with great reputations who do an excellent job and uh, certainly uh, we've tried to be among them you're right up the top. Yep. Mm. And Nick, we talk about genetics all the time when we talk about horses and sire mm. of sires and broodmare sires. Um, I know where you're going with this. <laughs> <laughs> you, you and your wife Jackie have certainly, uh, you know, earned a great reputation in the mm. industry, and now you have your kids mm. branching out and and being very involved in the industry as well. What does that do for you as a, as a father? As a dad, it it, it makes you very proud. Um, and um, the other thing it does for me as a father is it allows me to take half a step backwards from the sale process, which Jackie and I have been doing for many years, as you know, closing in on 40 years. And um, um, I'm nearly ready to pass the baton, and I'm in small increments doing that a little bit year by year. And uh, so it, as a dad, it makes you proud, and it also is very gratifying to have um, a son who, and daughter-in-law come to that that uh, are capable of uh, carrying on, carrying the name forward and carrying the business forward. Ali and Brandon, my daughter and son-in-law, have also done very well, uh, quite independently, and um, that makes you very proud too. So we're, we're, we're proud parents and proud grandparents too, I might add. You should be. Um, one, one last question for me. There's been, I think, a shift towards uh, focusing on safety mm. in the industry, on the racetrack, mm. in terms of getting rid of drugs. What do you think is something that in the two-year-old sector, in the two-year-old sales mm. sector, is either being done better or can be do better? Can, can be done better in the last couple of years? Well, um, I, I've served on the OBS board for, for uh, 25 plus years, and it's a, it's, a, it's a conversation we frequently have in the boardroom. Um, we're always trying to do things a little better without giving our our customers and our consignors an impossible job to do. Um, I think that uh, you know we're, we're doing a, 
uh, random testing more and more. Uh, we're uh, curtailing uh, whipping, uh, uh, as you know, and we're we're trying to present uh, a, a clean, safe product um, that gives buyers confidence to do business with the company and in the two-year-old sector of the market. Um, touch wood, and I I, I wouldn't say this in since uh, until the breeze show was completed but it was a very safe breeze show there were, there were no misdemeanors and I think that can be said of pretty much all the breeze shows uh, that have gone forward this year um, in terms of uh, racetrack type injuries and the horses are vetting well after their their workouts so I think that that does um, reflect well on, on, on the process um, the surface that we have here has really been a, a big step forward for us as a sale company and um, I, I think a perfect case in point is we have a two and a half inch rain the night before the last day of the breeze show and we have a great track to work, breeze horses on. On a conventional surface we wouldn't even be having this conversation. Right. right. Never right. had to delay the sale. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Well Nick I don't have any other questions for you but I do have a comment for, for our audience mm. because I've known you for over 30 years, mm. you and Jackie, and I've watched you guys do things with such integrity and such mm. grace in the industry. And I know as an end user buyer, we have great confidence in mm. buying from Demerick Sales. Um, and, and it's been a privilege to watch you guys grow from coming from, you know, coming yeah. to Ocala um, with a couple dollars in your pocket and living in a trailer to, uh, you know, the behemoth, uh, you know, consigner that you are right now. Um, so it is the American dream. You guys really are the well, American dream. You're kind to say so. Jackie and I d did our time uh, as exercise riders and, and grooming and mucking stalls. We, we, neither of us are too proud to do any of that uh, uh, to this day. But um, it's, been, it's been a wonderful ride and, and we're very proud of our relationship with the Green Group and with Jonathan and Len Green. And we, are, we uh, uh, feel enormously privileged to, to number among you, among you, among our favorite clients. Well, he's my much. favorite co-host, so I want to in the same boat there. Only because I'm the only one here. <laughs> <laughs> well, Nick, thank you so much for stopping by. Good luck the rest of the sale. We really appreciate thank the time. Thank you. We can always use good luck, and uh, we appreciate all you do. And uh, thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Nick. Right. That was appreciate really well it. done. Great job. Right well done. That was perfect. That was perfect. Yeah. So batting cleanup in the hot seat. Today here on the TDN Writers Room is West Point Thoroughbreds. Terry Finley, come on down. Good to be down. Good, Good to, to be see down. You, Terry. What's up, John? Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Great to have you. Uh, Great to see you. I think everybody, I was saying to Nick Demerick and a couple other guys, it seems like everybody's in a good mood to be back here and hanging out. You, I think overall, yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, as good a mood they, as racing people can be in, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, I would say overall, there, there's, a, there's a segment of our population that is on the happy side, and others, others they tend to find some negative things in, in their day to day, but you know, I, like to, I like to side with the people who are always looking forward and positive. Well, that's why we kicked Bill off the show for this one. They wanted to keep <laughs> it Get all positive. Get Finley out of here. Uh, all right, so first question. You happen to outbid my friend and his father over here yes. on a morning line fill yesterday. So I want to know about this. How does a morning line fill, he was an Oklahoma bred, who breeze 10 and 1, go for 310000 And why is it a competition to be the best TDN sponsor? <laughs> well, I... You know, I, w I would say when you win in the, in the auction game, you're often thinking about, am I the only person in this whole arena that thinks that this horse is worth 310000 Obviously, I was. But you know, we've always been a fan of that stand. Uh, you know, I know they shipped him to New Mexico, I think, right? And he, and he got sick, and I think he died. But uh, we had a really good horse, um, uh, 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 Seven Trumpets, uh, who won... Right. Uh, actually just got beat in the Allen Jerkin. So, you, you know, he's a stallion that we know and uh, we have a lot of partners who are, are, are privy to him. So, and she was just a big, beautiful filly. And, you know, I spent some time around her in the back and, you know, she just kind of grew on you. And so when you have those uh, types of situation, you don't stop until, you know, you really have to say uncle, but I, I, uh, uh, two good owners, you know, I fell on a very good filly and, 
you know, we'll see what happens. Yeah, she was, she was beautiful. And quite frankly, we weren't going to go even to 300. But I think, uh, you know, Len saw you bidding on it and said, all right, he I'm going to hang it a couple more right. times. Just now, no, she was a beautiful filly. And, and, you know, we bred November Snow, who's the grand dam of Morning Line, which is one of the reasons why That's we right. were so interested in her. But just stunning filly. And, 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 you know, you've been able to buy the top athletes over the, the past couple of years. And I think that um, those athletes have performed for you on the racetrack in, in most of the big races. Um, you know, none bigger than the uh, the fact that we're going to run against each other in the Kentucky Derby. So what is that like when you have a horse in the Kentucky Derby, which you've won a Derby before, but now you yeah. have a new shooter and some new investors on this one? So I, I tell you, John, we, I don't know, we bought, I don't know, 15 or 18 Colts uh, in between uh, to get the class of uh, 2020. So, you know, up until the fall, I, I, you know, we, we hadn't really had a horse that, that, that had stepped forward. So we saw Obezos at uh, the fairgrounds and he broke his maiden, what, going five and a half off the turf. And uh, Jeff Lipson, who works with us in, in uh, the Midwest said, I like this horse, I like this horse. I, 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 so I took a look at him, I think he ran a 68 going five and a half, but he did it the right way. And you know, overall we thought that they were fair with the price and uh, took a shot, we bought a third of them. So I don't know, 60 days later, we're in a pretty good spot and uh, we're all trying to live the dream and uh, see if everything comes through. Uh, and it comes true on the first Saturday in May, which is what, 10 days away or whatever. Yeah. And, and counting. Believe me, we're counting. <laughs> <laughs> he won't stop talking about it. He's got shirts uh, if you want a helium <laughs> shirt. I'll uh, take one. Why not? Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Um, but so I wanted yeah. to follow up on that because I feel like this sale, the proximity to the Derby really helps because there's no more apparent time of year of what the future could hold for these yeah. two-year-olds. So do you, first of all, do you agree with that? Secondly, does it help you guys at all with recruitment for partners at sure. this sale specifically? Sure, Joe, yeah. You know, I think it does. And I, I think one of the things that solidifies like a two-year-old sale is uh, you look at the, at the top 25 horses that are in contention for the Derby, obviously the top 20, and then the five that are, you know, kind of at the doorstep, uh, you know, anxiously awaiting the, the shot to get in. You know, you would be surprised. They're not. Uh, they don't all come from day one in September, and and they don't all cost six hundred thousand. They come from all over the all over the place, all over the you know the spectrum of of our price tag. So I think that's what keeps everybody in. Yeah, the fact that you can, you can come here, you're probably not going to get a great pedigree, but you're going to get a a great athlete, and you're going to take a shot, and you're going to try to get to the big races. Obviously, for the rest of uh, 2021, and then into 2022 but you know the thing is you just got to buy them and you got to get involved with them and you know you have to get on the dance floor uh to win the dance contest right right and terry i'm going to take you back a little bit in history and and you guys have really revolutionized and set the standard for partnerships um and it wasn't always the way that wasn't the way that people owned horses you know 20 30 years ago for the most part how did you see the opportunity to have a partnership uh, entity in horse racing. Well, John, I, you know, I tell you, I, I really studied uh, Cot Campbell for quite a few years, and at, at that time, Cot was at, at the beginning of uh, the '90s. I was just uh, getting out of the army, and uh, you know, I was either going to go to work for, or actually go to work for uh, Johnson and Johnson, or or try my luck uh, in, in uh, the racing business. And Cot really set the standard. You know, he he trailblazed for all of us and I, I dare say he saved the game for us, right? right? Because yeah. if you think about the industry as it stands now without partnerships, I kind of shudder, right. I kind of shudder. And I, I do, I attribute that to Ann and to Cot Campbell because they really, you know, year after year, and I know it was probably tough back in the 70s and you know, to be in Saratoga and to try to win and, and to tr uh, try to participate and to have all those people in the boxes kind of look down their noses at Cot and Ann. And I, I, I'm just so glad that they persevered. I really am. So Terry, you've also, aside from the partnership evolution, you've also evolved personally going from a couple of different boards to now you're on the Jockey Club board. Yeah. What is that, take us behind the scenes as to like what a, uh, what's on the agenda, um, you know, when you sit down for a Jockey Club meeting and, and what we can yeah. expect as, you know, participants in the industry of, with their leadership. Yeah, so I think the Jockey Club's done a good job overall. So I was elected 18 months ago, John, and, you know, I, I think when people talk about the Jockey Club, I, I, I engage with people all over the industry, you know, as, as I travel around to see the horses run and, 
and to the sales. And I, I, actually, the only time I get a little miffed is when people talk about the jockey club that was 30 years ago. I mean, the jockey club's a lot different. And you look at the, the technology platforms and the, and, and the marketing platforms and all the other things, obviously the integrity platform, which is I, 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 certainly a whole nother endeavor and, and a conversation. But you put that, all those things together and I think you have a significant body of work that is really going to be at the centerpiece and at the center of the progress that we're going to make into the future. So I'm just proud to be part of it. And, you know, I, I think we have a lot of good things in the future. That brings me to my last question. I'm a little, a little nervous talking Bring to a sponsor. Um, <laughs> right, so we were asking some of the consigners and kind of what can be done better on the two-year-old sales sector in terms of safety for the animals. And no, you're not a consigner, but you spend a lot of time on the backstretch. You spend yeah. a lot of time around the barns. What do you think those things are? Well, I, I, do, I do think the safety aspect is the essence of, of our whole industry, in particular, the two-year-old sales. So we've got to figure it out. You know, we have to do a better job with these two-year-old sales. And, and to think that, uh, that you see as many horses uh, that occur that, that work a, a nine and four and ten flat right before I think I bought a horse that worked 10 flat and it was the it was the first one and that was probably I don't know 15 years ago. I don't know what were there 29 and 4s at, right, at yeah, the sale. Yeah. So look, I, I know it's very complex and to think that anybody's going to uh, uh, come in and uh, tell these uh, consigners to uh, to slow the horses down, right? right. That's not going to work. Not gonna but work. Yeah. I sense that there is a solution out there and I, I I don't know, I just don't have my arms around it yet, but I think people see as as the industry is uh, contracting and instead of having 40,000 foals, we have 20,000. Right. Everyone is very important yeah, right. know, to stay healthy and to stay in the game and, and to run on Thursday and on Friday. You know, everybody loves to run on Saturday, but, you know, the, the, the meat and potato horses, yeah. right, we need them. And to think uh, that we have a, uh, a chance to do better in the future. Right. And I'd offer to the two-year-old consigners, if, our, if all of us as, as an industry, if, 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 if we don't get better, I think the two-year-old, I think the future of the two-year-old sales is in, in a jeopardy. Right. But I think there's a, uh, there's a better way. Right. So I'd love to hear from consigners because I'd like to play a part. And I know all the buyers at the two-year-old sale, right? We're all in this together. Yes. We, we really are. We're all in. And uh, you know, all of us, if, if the industry gets better, we all get better. And, uh, you know, the, the success we can all, all have individually, I think, is going to help. So. Well, and this is like one of the more behind the scenes components, I think, that, you know, people get outraged about breakdowns on the racetrack, but they don't yeah. necessarily know all the stuff that goes on behind the scenes. And I think it is getting better over time, but there's yeah. a lot of work to yeah. do. And, I, you know, I think the TDN, uh, you know, the writer's room and, and every day, you, right, you start to read about, uh, uh, you know, owners and buyers that, uh, right, we don't want 10 flats, right? right. We'd much rather a controlled 10 and 2 yeah. uh, and they gallop out the right way. So anyway, you know, moderation is always key. Yeah. And I, I think that's probably the at the heart of the, of the solution going forward. Right. Good. All right. Thanks. Thanks for stopping by, Terry. Really appreciate it. Enjoy. Best of luck the rest of the really sale. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bye, thanks, appreciate Terry. it. The Green Group Guests of the Week are sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As this week's Green Group Guests of the Week, they will all receive a free one-hour tax consultation. You get a tax consultation. You get a tax consultation. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. The Green Group is widely recognized as the top-rated tax and accounting firm specializing in the horse business. Why do the top owners, breeders, pin hookers, and trainers trust the Green Group as their tax advisors? The difference is experience. Firm founder Len Green has over four decades of experience owning, breeding, and racing horses. First-hand knowledge gives Green Group clients proven tax and money-saving strategies. Visit the Green Group at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. All right, so that's going to do it for this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room, presented by Keeneland. A reminder that the Keeneland April Horses of Racing Age sale is Monday, April 26th at 1 p.m. So from beautiful Ocala, I want to thank John Green, our Green Group Guests of the Week, Randy Miles, Nick Demerick, and Terry Finley, as well as Doc Eisenman, our wonderful producer, Patty Wolf, and our excellent team who flew down here, maybe they drove, to be part of this. We appreciate it, you guys. Nathan Wilkinson, Anthony LaRocca, and Aliyah LaRocca, thank you guys so much. We will see you next week. 
back on Zoom.